Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show. We're taking a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're on the path to great restorative dentistry, you're always wanting to improve the communication you have with your lab. And today we're going to be talking about why your redos aren't necessarily your lab's fault and how you can greatly improve that communication with a master, Dr. Drew Cobb from the Dawson Academy. Do not miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a few seconds. The Best Practices Show with Kirk Barrent is brought to you exclusively by ACT Dental, the ultimate provider of dental practice management solutions for dentists and their teams. ACT Dental is committed to helping you build a better practice and a better life. If you're looking to grow your production, motivate your team, get back on track, and create the practice you've always dreamed about, look no further. Give us a call at 800-851-8186 or visit us at actdental.com. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all of your suggestions, and we love it. Now up over 26,000 followers on Facebook, and over 115,000 of you have found us on iTunes, and I don't know how that works, but thank you so much, and we're having a good time. And along the path of high-quality restorative dentistry. We've got my good friend, Dr. Drew Cobb on today, and you're going to love this. Uh, so don't miss this. Now, before we get started, a couple things. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you have questions, if they come up, ask them during the live show, put them right in the feed and I'll ask Drew himself and we'll get the answers straight from the master. Or if you're watching these later on, which we're watching a lot of the metrics, some of the young dentists are watching these uh, in the evenings, uh, feel free to add the questions to the feed and we'll see if we can't get you the answer because we want you to get the most out of this. Now, my guest today is one of the secret senior faculty members. Um, one of the, first of all, you're just a great guy. Number two, I love spending time with you. And number three, you are a brilliant restorative dentist. Now I know who you are, you've been on the show many times. And in case somebody's watching this for the first time, because we do have a lot of dental students watching this sure. and they don't know who Drew Cobb is or the Dawson Academy, Give us a little intro on uh, who you are and what that is. Sure. So I'm Drew Cobb. I practice in Washington, D.C., born and raised here. Uh, you know, I, I grew up kind of in dentistry. My pops was a faculty member at Georgetown where I went to school. Taught me my very first day of dental school, which was always kind of an interesting experience. But, uh, you know, the quick story is I practiced the way I was taught, at, you know, at Georgetown. I had a great foundation education, but I practiced that way for about 10 years. But after a while, I started to notice a couple things. One is dentistry I'd done didn't last as long as I thought it should. I didn't have that predictability thing. And the second thing is I started seeing more patients with more complex problems that I just didn't know how to solve those issues. And it made me frustrating. Uh, I was you know, out 10 years and I had a long career ahead of me. And I honestly, I didn't see how I was going to do this for another 30 or some years and still enjoy what I did. Mm -hmm. And so um, I got, I was fortunate at Georgetown, I had come across Pete Dawson's book. He actually lectured at Georgetown. I'd heard him before. And I was like, you know what? I got to go listen to Pete Dawson before he retires. Of, co of course, now that's, you know, over 20 years ago and he's still, he's still teaching, which mm -hmm. is amazing. He's still at the lectures. So uh, I went to Dawson Data Academy and, and I implemented what I learned, but that I'll never forget that first lecture, Kirk. It just, it just changed, changed my life as a dentist. It's like, that was, there. here was the missing link. This was, these were the answers to the questions I had. And it was honestly about predictability, long-term results, and kind of a better lifestyle as a dentist, you know, stop mm -hmm. the rat race. And I think I was so frustrated that I went through, I'm going to say the hard part of implement, implementing what I learned. You know, we go out and we get knowledge and it's great, but you're not going to affect change unless you bring it back to your offices and change the way you do things. Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll be here to tell you it's the best thing I ever did. I kind of look at my, my dental career as pre-Dawson, post-Dawson. Yeah. Trust me, post-Dawson has been a lot more fun put that passion back into it for me. And, you know, this is a business, uh, hugely more profitable than I was before. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah. So, um, so then I've been fortunate. I, I've been able to stay associated with Dawson Academy and I teach for them. I'm the director of the core curriculum. And, you know, my, my, my want really is, is to change the lives of more dentists. I know that's why Pete started this to, you know, at the very beginning, but, you know, if, if others can practice this way, 
And you end up with much better care for your patients. This isn't about you know trying to sell more dentistry. This is actually about looking at things in a more complete way, solving patients, getting patients healthy for the long term. Yeah, and that's why I love this dialogue with you. You said it, you know, in, in as you were describing your path. But if you look at anyone's path, if you're watching this, your path has always had somebody in it that said, no, go this way. And it changed yeah. the way you thought, yeah. the way you lived or communicated. And for me, it was Pete Dawson on this road in dentistry at the age of 24. And I was like, this is incredible because I'd never heard anything like that. And the second thing is, is that if you're looking to get better in dentistry, you and I were talking about this before we go, we went live. You know, one of the goals is to solve more complex problems yeah. as you progress in your career. It's very yeah. satisfying. It establishes you as an expert. And so the D Dawson Academy journey has just been an incredible one. And you've taken us through this, through all these shows uh, and the process uh, leading up to the lab communication. Yeah. Now, before we get into this, I want you to pause. <laughs> And how important is the lab communicate? Let's talk about the why before yeah. we get into the how on this. It's huge. You know what? You can't do this without your lab, you know? Right. Uh, uh, and, and it's almost like the lab has to get into your head. Like, we, we can't expect the lab to give us this great result if we don't give them the information for them to do their jobs. And I think, unfortunately, most times, if you talk to most lab technicians, they get, they don't, they get a fraction of what they need to do their jobs. And if you think about it, in a certain regard, they need everything that, that we see and able to get that end result. So, and if we start pulling things off the table, can they do it? You know, they don't have act, I mean, it, and it's simple stuff. I mean, this is so important. And, and I know we want to talk about, you know, more complex dentistry, you know, all on four and doing implants and aesthetic dentistry and everything else, which is, which is fabulous. It's some of the things that we can really make changes in somebody's lives. But the foundation for all of that restorative work is based on good and accurate records and communication. And if we don't start with that, it, you know, you're not going to get a good result. In fact, it's, you know, ex our problems are exponential as we go on through the steps. It reminds me, we've talked about this before, but it reminds me of one of the things that my dad used to say. And I got a lot of these lines from both Pete Dawson and my dad that I think about every day. Mm -hmm. But one of the things my dad always said to the students, and I know we've said this before, I'll drive people crazy, but you know, what's the most important step to any procedure? Mm -hmm. It's the one it's you're the, working on. The one you're on. And so yeah. if we make a mistake there, especially if it's early on, we're just compounding mistakes as we go through. And again, I always think about this for records. You know, I, I'm, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the digital world, which is where we're going. But right now, I still think most of us live in this analog world. So we're still taking traditional impressions. We're mounting them. But we got to take you got to take good impressions. I mean, right. as basic as that. So you got to use good materials. Uh, and these impressions, that's not just getting the teeth, but you got to get the teeth and the land areas and the muscle attachments and the full palate. You can't get half of a palate. You got to get good impressions and they got to be accurate. So you got to use materials that are accurate. You got to pour them up in stones and you got to have a way of doing that, that, you know, it's not the old dental school thing where, you know, a little powder and you stick it under the sink and you add some water. You got to measure everything. You got to have good materials. If you're using stone, we want to use stones that have a degree of thermal expansion of 0.1% or less. Mm -hmm. uh, same with your mounting stones. You want to have a team member that is an accurate person that's going to follow this for you. When we talk about some of these things, Kirk, uh, I, I know as young dentists, you're thinking, I got so much stuff to do already. And the more you guys talk, it sounds like more work for me. The reality of it is, is it's not. This is, you know, this kind of dentistry is a team approach. And, mm -hmm. and by team, I mean your team in your office, your interdisciplinary team, whatever specialist you might be working with, orthodontist, endodontist, periodontist, your lab technician is part of that team. Uh, and so we have to have good communication. We have to be accurate throughout their team. And if we are, that's where you get that. We can have predictable results at the end. Yeah. Now I want you to pause if you're watching this because Drew, you and I were talking. This is not about you as a dentist. How do you do more? You have to take yeah. somebody on this journey with you so that you can multiply your efforts. And honestly, yeah. I, I want to reference something that Pete gave me. He gave me a slide like 10 years ago and you've seen me present it, it or anyone has this. It's a slide with a little red circle and he called that the circle of productivity. And he said, your practice will grow when you spend your time doing only what you can do. So when you look 
look at the legal ramifications mm. of this, like really as a dentist, you got to think, how can I provide the most value? And then how do I bring people with me that can do the things yeah. that I don't have to do? And that's a challenge for a lot of dentists to let yeah. this go. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, again, with, uh, with that whole teamwork thing in your office, like most of these things, a well-trained staff does a lot of this. So we start thinking about the time, you know, so we say, you know, get the models and the impressions and photos, all the things we'll talk about here in a little bit more, but your team does all that. The doctor yeah. doesn't have to do that. You know, when we start talking about the records. I mean, you have to do the actual work on the patient. You got to prepare the teeth. You, you got to be there for the impressions. You've got to get what we refer to as the centric bite record. The rest of everything else, as we start going through this, your team members can get. They can get the photos. They can get the the uh, models. They do the mounting and everything else. So this for the doctor, this really isn't adding more time. And in fact, when you go to the to the end, when you're de delivering the final restorations, if that appointment goes smoothly and accurately, and when you actually get into the treatment appointments, especially on multi-unit, more complex cases, those appointments go efficiently. You're mm -hmm. saving time. You're also saving headaches, and you're probably adding years to your life because there's nothing worse than having a long restorative appointment not go well or a delivery day where you have multi-units not go well. And so right. that's why in the, in the title we talked about remakes. What does a remake cost your practice? Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Depends on the nature of the practice, but yeah. really, it's expensive in dollars. It's expensive in stomach lining. You know, it's <laughs> it's expensive yeah. all the way around. And I think it's it's exponential is 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 the cost because you're right. It's you can put it in a dollar value on you know what's your unit per crown, and it's like one and a half times that. I've heard some consultants mm -hmm. say so. There's a dollar value there, right. but. You're right. It's it's the angst you go through, the stress you go through. You know, in this day, in this you know, with, with with where we are now in the internet and internet reviews and everything else like that, it it can it can hurt your your um, reviews or your or, or you know who you are on the internet as far as that things go. We want to be known for solving problems and predictability. Not that it's going to take two or three times as long. They're going to have to do it multiple times. So. You know, we only got one shot at that, you know, and yeah. patients nowadays can be very quick to, to post things. You know, you want something posted, you know, good about your practice. So, Amen, buddy. Um, Amen. so the more predictable we can stay with that and stay away from remakes, it's going to make life so much easier, which is one of the things I love about this kind of dentistry. Uh, you know, for the most part, it is predictable. That's one of the things we talk about, about following a pathway and a series of checklists to get us there. And that's one of the things that helps us communicate with the laboratory. Yeah. So take us through your thinking because I love, you know, you've got <clears throat> checklists and workflows and protocols for everything yeah. and I love it. Yeah. And, you know, and the reason for that is predictability. And so we don't forget something because right. it's easy to forget something if we're just living in our mind, you know, and, and then you don't know it until it's too late. So we mm -hmm. want to try to avoid those moments. So the first slide, if we bring up, and this is kind of where we left off last time we spoke, Kirk is you've, you've kind of gotten to the treatment planning part. You've done an exam on somebody, you've gotten the necessary records, you've had a conversation with that patient. They want us to solve their problems. Those are the ones we're focusing on. We're not trying to talk people into dentistry that they don't need. Somebody wants us to solve their problems. So now we're gonna sit down with the ne necessary info, models, um, you know, our evaluation, all those records, and we're gonna work it out now. So we're gonna work it out three-dimensionally. We treatment plan by what we refer to as that Widium rule, would I do it on me? Again, uh, one of the things I really like about what I learned from Pete Dawson is that this is ethical dentistry. Again, it's not about talking people into dentistry they don't need. It's about, number one, looking in and identifying their problems, trying to find out their solutions with the least amount of dentistry, and then providing them with that care predictably. Yeah. And so the next slide, I think, you know, is again, one of those things uh, that I heard from Pete early on. And this is a quote from uh, Clyde Schuyler, who is one of his contemporaries. Sloppy models are not an indication of sloppy dentistry is proof. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love so, that because it's so, true. You know, they don't say garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage stays. You know, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where it just comes in and yeah. you can't get any better than that. So how important is that in the evolution of a restorative it's, dentist? It's, you know, it, it's a starting point for this. So if you're going to start yeah. doing, if you really want to start doing predictable dentistry, 
you got to start with accuracy. And and again, I'm going to say, I know it's not the sexy thing to talk about, but foundationally it is. You got to start with good, accurate materials. So living in this analog world right now, really good impressions, mount them, things have to be clean. You got to be able to work on them. Again, if you just look at this slide, you know, you don't have just the teeth and a millimeter, because we see this frequently, just the teeth, a millimeter or two of soft tissue above the gingival margin. You don't have palates, you don't have the land areas. If we're going to start making aesthetic decisions on these models, and what's the right dimensions and proportion of the teeth for this patient, and, and maybe we have to move tissues, you know, lo lo shorter or longer, whatever we're going to do. If you don't have the whole anatomy of that patient, we can't make those decisions and we certainly can't make it accurately. And if we can't start with that accurately, that means we can't deliver the treatment accurately. So right. you got to start with this. And it's not, you know, gosh, it's not difficult. And again, the doctor doesn't have to do it. You just got to get your staff to do it. And even if we go to the digital world and we're going to scan the, the digitally, it's all the same. You still got to understand why we're doing things. So you got to start with accuracy. And if you start with accuracy and things are clean, we're going to be more accurate as we go through the process. Another thing, Kirk, is, you know, we might be showing these um, to a patient. You know, sometimes we, when we have the wax up that we'll talk about in here just a little bit, is that the patient might see that. Well, if they're seeing sloppy models and stone all over the place, you know, what are they going to think? You know, mm -hmm. but if it, everything is clean and neat, it's just like keeping your operatories clean and neat. It looks like it's sterile. You don't want to have stuff all over the place. You don't want to have something that looks dirty and not accurate. Right. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, as far as the models go, I, on top of it too, you're learning so much when you get a chance to do this. And we used to joke, you know, when you don't do this, you lean heavy on the co-discovery piece, which is, <laughs> I didn't look at it, but really when you can see it, yeah. It gives you a whole greater sense of where we're going, what the wear patterns are, and what questions you might ask the patient before you even get a chance to be with them. Absolutely. In fact, if you go to the next slide, the mounted diagnostic cast, I keep hitting on this, but that's really our foundation or what we call that dental blueprint. So, you know, when you start, and this isn't, this isn't, again, the patient needs one crown. Remember, we're talking about more complex cases here. But honestly, what you really want to try to do is simple as this, take the before models and we've already figured out what we think has to happen two-dimensionally. We've talked in an earlier program about going through the two-dimensional checklist. Again, nothing that's difficult. And all we're really doing is taking what we thought we needed to do two-dimensionally and now let's put it on the models. It gives you a trial run. Before mm -hmm. we picked up a handpiece, before we've done anything irreversible to a patient, we get to see, is this the right treatment? And honestly, we're going to work it out on the models first. So what I love about this with predictability is we, we work things out in our mind. We work things out then three-dimensionally. And we do all that before we pick up a handpiece and do anything irreversible on a patient. I would much rather have the models and, you know what, make a mistake. Maybe this wasn't the treatment. Or maybe I need to do things a little bit differently because, gosh, Kirk, it's a lot easier to just make a new set of models and go through my proposed plan better. Right. And this is, again, where the predictability comes in. And I'm working this out with my laboratory. But then by the time you actually go to the patient to do the work, we've worked this out a couple times. Now you know better what is all the treatment that has to happen. What treatment am I going to do at the, the appointments? How do I want to sequence the appointments? Maybe, maybe it's a couple units. Maybe it's a lot of units. But what, you as the doctor, how do you want to do that? Are you comfortable doing 10 or 12 units at a time? Do you want to break things up smaller? You get to do it any other way, but if you don't work it out on the models somehow and figure out your plan, you won't know your pathway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the 3D checklist, which is kind of the next slide, Kirk, and talking about the checklist, really all this checklist is, is how to do a wax up. Whether you do it or the lab does it or you do it kind of half and half, there's all ways to do that. You need a way to communicate with your laboratory and so that we don't miss steps. So rather than just picking up a set of models and haphazardly start adjusting them or adding wax here and there, there's a way to do this in a more program predictable approach. Yeah, absolutely. Now you're a big fan. We're going to talk probably about the uh, Dawson Diagnostic Wizard, but you have two different types of checklists. 
don't you? And you're going to yeah. go through that, right? Yeah. So we have two. So one is this, I'll, I'll say this uh, 3D wax up checklist, you know, how to do the wax up. And again, right now, I think we're in the analog world. Eventually we're going to be doing wax ups digitally. So it'll be on a program. So you don't have to heat the wax and add it, which takes some people back to um, dental school and, and, and bad rem- uh, remembrances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So personally, I like to wax up. I find it very, uh, really relaxing. I learn a lot by actually doing it with my hands. Because if I do it digitally, honestly, because I've started to do some, but I, I, I don't get that touch and feel that I get with actually doing the wax ups. You know, I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll learn more as you, as you get more comfortable with it. But I like actually touching because in the end, that's how I'm doing the dentistry. I'm not doing the dentistry digitally at the end. At least, at least we're not replaced by robots yet. We still need us, um, yeah. as far as that goes. And then the next wax up, or the next checklist, Kirk, that you referred to is, you know, once we get prototypes on the patient and everything's worked out and and we've we've checked everything, there's a way that we're going to check them and verify them for aesthetics and phonetics and function. And once we have that we got to accurately get that to the laboratory so that they're really copying that in our definitive restorations. So there's no guesswork on their side. So we have a checklist to how to communicate with a laboratory, how to get them everything they need so that they can do our job, do their job. Yeah. And can you pause on that too? Because a lot sure. of times we think what's in our best interest and how we get stressed, but we really have to set them up for success. And you got, you have an awesome white paper that is called yeah. the confessions of a lab. Just yeah. put those two pieces together for us. Can you? So, yeah. So that's a, yeah, so if you ask, if you ask a lab technician, ones you work with others, maybe you don't work with, Do they get the information they need to do a wax up if you want your laboratory to do the wax up or to do different investigation? Do they get everything they need? Like what percentage of the time do they get everything they need? My guess, and and I know this, is that most times the lab has to waste a lot of time calling the doctor for X, Y, or Z that they don't have. Now, and maybe the doctor didn't even get it. So now the doctor, what do you got to do? Now you got to call your patient and, and I need this record or that record. It doesn't look, make anybody look good. So mm-hmm. the laboratories spend a lot of time trying to get information that they didn't receive or that the doctor didn't even get to start with. So this right. is where I think we got to all be on the same page, which is why I like that checklist. But Jeff Stubblefield is at DAL Lab, and, and, and he's, a, he's a great technician. He wrote this white paper for us. But, uh, and, it was, and it was basically, um, you know, how can we work better? So some mm-hmm. of the things he notices in this is that, you know, number one, the bite records are off. So, you know, again, it's simple things, but if a case isn't mounted right, they could make, your lab could make the most beautiful restorations in the world, but when we go to put them in, they're not even close. So now, mm. whose fault is that? Yeah. I think probably nine times out of 10, it's our fault. It's the doctor's fault. So we didn't get, like, they, now, sometimes can they mismount? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, but if we don't give them accurate records to mount on, how can they? So are they guessing on amount because we didn't give them what they needed to have? So you got to communicate that, Um, you know, not getting them what they need. Um, The prototypes are so important. So with anterior restorations, multi-units, we're trying to figure out in space where front teeth should go. And so, and the things that have to come together on that are function. So we want them to function the way that they should. All those things that Pete's talked about for years, satisfying the five factors of stable occlusion, getting the anterior guidance right, envelope of function. We spend a lot of time in our two-dimensional and three-dimensional workup to try to get that right. In the prototypes, the nice thing about it is the prototypes are a test drive. Did we do it? Do we need to make changes? It is much easier to make changes when we're still in plastic and not in glass. If right. we're a little too long, hey, we can, we can alter that. How long does it take us to shorten central incisors if they're in plastic half a millimeter? About 15 seconds? Yeah. Can we make things longer if we're off? So the, the prototype step is we get to really check that phonetically, aesthetically, and functionally, we've designed those the way that we want. And we're proving it in the mouth. Now, yeah. if we've gotten there, you know what? All we got to do is get that info to the lab 
we can then communicate the aesthetic part and we can talk about micro aesthetics and really making these provisionals look like natural teeth. But unless we, we get that info to the lab, they can't do it. So we yeah. got to have a way then to communicate that so that the, the lab is in essence just replicating what we've already proven in the mouth. Yeah, a good rule of thumb, we teach all the practices we coach on this, is that communication is really not two people, it's one person. The The person who's sending the information holds the responsibility of communicating clearly. So while you might not entirely grasp that, think about this, when yeah. things go bad from a communication standpoint, it's really easy to say, well, they didn't get it. Well, it's our job to make sure it's over communicated, you know, and so that yeah. makes their job easy in this whole Absolutely. process. So, you know, a, another thing, if you talk to Jeff or, or, or another lab tech that does wax ups. So again, cause this is such an important part. The lab wax up is so important because it's how you really figure out, is this the right treatment? What is it we need to do? What are the steps? And then honestly, what's my plan? How many appointments do I need? And then also it's the only way you can figure your fees. So right. until you kind of get to that trial run, you're, you're trying to kind of guessing. And I'm sure you talk to your clients about this, but when you do more complex cases, and, and, and I, by that, I, I don't mean that it has to be, you know, 32 units. It could be four units of crown and bridge or, or veneers, whatever it is. It can still be, you know, conservative restorative work. But until you figure out your steps, like what it is I need to do, you can't figure out how you're going to charge for it. Because this is not, uh, I did four restorations and I charge X for four restorations because you're doing other things. So you might have in here... I'm going to visualize it two-dimensionally, and I'm going to have my lab finish my wax up. Well, mm -hmm. they're going to charge you for that. And if you don't figure that in your planning, then it's coming out of your profit. So you've got to add that to what you think your fees are going to be. If we're making lots of changes on function or smile on somebody, they might have to come back once or twice for us to do that approved provisionals. Make sure we've got the phonetics and everything else right and aesthetics function before we go to definitive restorations. Mm -hmm. Gosh, sometimes with big changes, maybe you're even going to want to remake a set of prototypes just to make sure we're really, really there. Yeah. But again, all these things you've got to add to your fees so that you know, A, how many appointments, and then B, you know, what, what your, your fees are going to be. So um, going through the wax up is super important. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is when you communicate with the lab, here's what happens a lot. And this is unfortunate. So you got your models, you've gone through your 2D, you have in your mind what you want to do. So you send your models to the lab. And what is your script? How do you communicate the next part to the lab? What do you say mm -hmm. to them? Do you take half an hour? I mean, if you're accurate, do you take half hour, 45 minutes and write the world's best and longest lab script ever? No, you do what most of just do. You take one of those yellow post-its and you scribble like this and you put it in there yeah, and you send it to them and they go, what is this? Yeah. And it's, and, and here's, the, here's the instructions from the doctor, wax up. Yeah. A and if you're feeling good, you may, it's please wax up. Well, yeah. how, where do they go with that? Uh -huh. So, so, you know, we talk about, you know, three kinds of wax ups, um, but you, you, again, you got to get the information into the lab. Think about it. If you were going to wax it up, what would you need? So you need the models, everything accurate. You need the photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, you need your instructions. You need your treatment plan. What teeth are they going to wax up? Which teeth are you going to restore? Maybe we're going to sequence treatment over, over a series of time. Well, what are the teeth you're going to treat in the first sequence? Because those are the only ones you want to wax up. You don't want to do a full mouth wax up if that's not how you're going to restore the case in that order, because now the wax up doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. So you need to have all of that information go. And it's, you know what? It's not hard. Again, using what we've referred to and talked about before in the, the, the Dawson Diagnostic Wizard, it, it's a couple clicks and they get all of this information that you've already worked through. It, it saves me from the way I used to do it several years ago probably about 45 minutes to writing a consult for a more complex case. Uh, it's also a great way, as we talked before, about communicating with your specialist. So it just makes the whole process easier. Bottom line, though, is that the lab needs everything that we would need if we were going to do it themselves. So you yep. got to get them the models, the photos, the treatment plan, and particularly which teeth that you were going to restore. Mm -hmm. And I Absolutely. know it sounds funny, Kirk. 
But if you ask the lab, they don't get it that way that often. No. This is a great way to differentiate yourself from all the other dentists that refer yeah. to the lab too, because you'll quickly yeah. get moved to the top yeah. and the best technicians sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah. and then, you know, so, so where do we go from there from the wax up? So now, now you can really develop your treatment plan and, and your fees and everything else. Now, after the wax up, we're not necessarily going to treatment because we got to verify with the patient. We've already gotten a verbal verification before we go this far that a patient wants us to go to treatment. But now, now you really know everything. It's going to require these appointments. I might need these specialists to help get us here. Uh, here's the way we're going to proceed. Here, here are the fees for us. Uh, and then you have that conversation. I call it a treatment option review where the patient comes in and you know what, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, here are the things we talked about. I put it all together like I said I would. And now let's go through this again, just make sure we're on the same page. A right. And now you know your fees. <clears throat> and the next slide, we talk about three types of wax ups. And this really doesn't have to be that, that complicated. Minimal, full coverage, and the case presentation wax up. What we mean by the minimal treatment planning wax up is that's the part that we're doing as part of that three-dimensional checklist is, is I like to do a lot of that myself, but this isn't about like back in dental school, waxing up the whole teeth. It's literally just putting the wax on where we need it to make the change so we can visualize if it's the right thing. It, for instance, if we we're going to lengthen the centrals a millimeter, add a millimeter wax on it. You know, now is that proportion right? Do we like that with the length ratio? Can we still work out the function of them? So there's a lot that the doctor finds or, or, um, just by working through the models. And now once you get that, you can send that started wax up to the laboratory and then let them make everything pretty. That would be that full coverage wax up. So it's kind of a combination of those two that at the Dawson Academy, we have our doctors do. I probably, Kirk, do about 50% of the wax ups myself. But if it's going to be six to eight or 10 units, I won't wax up the whole thing because it's going to take me more time. So I'm right. going to send it to my, to my uh, lab technician and let them finish everything. Um, we used to a long time ago do those case presentation wax ups. And, you know, those are, I mean, they're beautiful. You can do the pink wax and make everything perfect. And you can still do those, but there's a different dollar value on that. That's the most. We used to show those to patients, you know, here's where we are at the beginning and here's where we could... I think doctors, like I love models and all this. I'm not sure all my patients love the model work like I do. Uh, and so I don't normally use the case presentation as a way to communicate um, like the end result with the patient. I want them to see that I did what I said I was going to do. But mm -hmm. if I really want them to see end results, I'll image. You yeah. know, I think that goes a long way to help with that case presentation and case acceptance. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, when you're doing the 3D, the next slide then, I mean, here's what we learned from the 3D wax up. You get to figure out function, aesthetics, the treatment plan like we talked about. But then once the patient gives you the approval and we've talked about the finances, all that's so all that's worked out. Well, now you know how to schedule. And, and if you've written your treatment plan up, because I think this is interesting sometimes is, Patients are going to start saying yes when you go through this process. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go through all this with a the patient. They're going to say, you know, gosh, thanks so much for working this out. Nobody's taken the time to, to put this effort into it before. Uh, you'll hear this all the time. They saw me one time and then they recommended X numbers of dollars of treatment. You didn't do yeah. that. You know, mm -hmm. you took the time to figure out the problems, how to solve them. You talked to me. You figured out a pathway. Now let's go. And then most dentists, you know, sometimes when you first start doing this, I know I did. It's like, well, now what do I do? Right. I've never had anybody say yes before. Mm -hmm. So now you know, need to go to your schedule, block out your time. These are longer appointments mostly. But now the, the beauty of this is you use the wax up to do the next stage. So this wasn't just an exercise in quote unquote selling the case or getting case acceptance. This was you've figured out in space what it is and where we want the teeth to be. Now we're going to be work backwards. We're going to use that for preparations so we can be a lot more conservative with our preparations because you're going from the end backwards. 
Yeah. So we're a lot easier. We're going to use it for our prototypes because you know what? We've already worked this out. So you can make really good prototypes quickly on these patients that look good, feel good, and you're not spending you know two hours doing. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a question on that sure. too? Because what sure. you just mentioned is very important. When you when you start doing this or you get good at this, talk about underestimating and overestimating. And are you a big fan of time studies? Because here's why. So many dentists go, oh, it only takes me that much time to do that. And the assistant goes, oh my gosh, yeah. he has he or she has no idea. Can yeah. you talk about the evolution, your sure. evolution and other yeah. dentists in this? Because yeah. this is a big deal. It is. Yeah, and you're and you're right. And you know, you're the expert on this as opposed to me. But but you know, when you're doing this kind of dentistry, I'm assuming we all have a production goal for the day. Right. So we want to produce X per day. So whatever your production goal is. If you start doing this kind of dentistry, again, they're more complex cases and a lot of times they're multi-unit, you're probably exceeding your production goal with this one patient. Mm -hmm. So why rush it? You know, right. why try to fit, you know, a three-hour appointment into two hours? Give yourself more time. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If you block off, I don't care, if you block off an extra hour and, and you, you're done in three hours and you have an extra hour, you know what? Again, You've exceeded your daily production. Relax, you know, have a have a cup of tea or something, you know, go check hygiene or maybe work on some other behind the scenes stuff. It's I think it's far worse to try to do this in too short of a time because now your stress level goes up. Uh, you're, you're more likely to miss something. So I think on these cases, I'm going to I'm going to take more time than needed. Yeah. You and I always joke, you know, dentists hate spaces. This might be one yeah. of those places that you get in love. You fall in love with space. They hate spaces yeah. in their schedule. They hate spaces yeah. in conversation. They hate spaces in teeth. Right. You know, just <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to have a space, right? Yeah, it is. But I will say it's, it's a mind adjustment because I was yeah. the same thing. And yeah. it's funny you say that because I know I always underestimate it, you know, uh -huh. and then the more you do it, you get comfortable with it. And, and, you know, generally when I do these longer patients, I don't want to be jumping back and forth between other patients. I really want to focus on this one patient, give it the best. The way I do my practice, we call most of our care primary care and secondary care. Yeah, primary can you pause care, on that? Oh, sure, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Tell us that. So primary care is the time pre-blocked in our schedule for these longer patients. I work seven to two. So from seven to 10 is primary care. And so that's for this. After 10 o'clock, after this long patient, that's where I'll put the roller skates on. And if I got to go room to room and smaller procedures here and there, that's, you know, that's all fine. But I don't want, I'm not double booking that long primary care appointment. I want to be focused on, on that patient. And I'll still be, you know what, I'll still be plenty productive with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because sometimes yeah. people think that, well, you're just completely stocked with full mouth dentistry all the time. And the truth of it is, is that you've got a good hybrid schedule. Yeah. And you know what? Listen, there, there are people out there that have gotten to this, you know, all they do is, you know, complex cases or something else. And, and I would say as a whole with the Dawson Academy, the faculty, certainly there, there you know, you do more and more of this, I'll say, you know, this kind of primary care patient, this specialty mm -hmm. patient, the complex care patient. But all of us have general patients. Like, I'm not going to turn patients away just because they don't need this other kind of dentistry. Uh, I have wonderful patients that have been in my practice for years. I have patients of my dad's. I'm not going to turn them away just because they don't have more complex needs. Uh, I do want to attract more of these complex patients. I mean, that's that's what I like to do. But I'm certainly not going to try to do a practice that's 100% specially complex cases. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'd probably, I mean, as much as I like to do it, um, it's still, uh, you know, predictable and fun, but it can be more stressful too. So, mm -hmm. so I think a, a good balance. And here's the great thing about dentistry, Kurt. It's a great profession. You yeah. get to decide what you want to do. You know, mm -hmm. do, do I want to try to make it all special? You know what? Go for it. It's your practice. It's your life. You know, go ahead and do it. Do I want to be 80%, 20%, 50-50? Do I want to occasionally do these more complex cases with my patients as they arise? It's perfectly great. You yeah. know, so you get to decide as a dentist how you want to practice, what procedures you want to do. Uh, and that's the, kind of the beauty of our profession, I think. How many people... And, and other professions get to do it like that. 
Yeah, it's amazing. And I think that's one of the most important points. That's that's what makes this profession so great is you can choose. You can choose how to yep. practice. You can choose yeah. great hours like yours. Everything yeah. is a choice. you know. Yeah. And if it doesn't work out, you can choose something else. And I don't know who said this, but years ago they said, <clears throat> as a dentist, you just got to choose to choose. You know, yeah. that's the hardest part. It's just, yeah. you know, you have a cho- it's not chosen for you. So keep going. I love this. Love it. Now, that, that's actually probably a great line too, because that's probably when I my, my pre-Dawson dental life, uh-huh. I, I didn't choose. Yeah. I, I was just following be- behind. You know, I, I didn't ever sit down to think about, as crazy as this sounds now, what do I want my life as a dentist to be? I mean, I was lucky. I got in. I was busy. And, I, you know, my schedule was full. But I was just reacting to every problem that was out there. I, I didn't take the time to be proactive to kind of figure out down the road how do I want this to be with my patients as well. That's right. why, you know, my my post Dawson life as a dentist has been so much better and so much more predictable and, you know, and fun. I mean, dentistry, you know, Pete says this, and I think it's a great thing. You know, dentistry is the best hobby going. It is. And and I mean, I know it's a business and I know dentistry, we all have, you know, stressful days and things happen and, and nothing can always be perfect. But, you know, the more you take control of your practice and your life as a dentist and, and that predictability comes in, Gosh, the more the joy and the passion creep back into things. It's a great profession. It's a great profession. It's amazing. So, you know, back to the to the lab part, you know, is, is part of that, that next slide then is, is again, uh, very important. What do they need? Again, we talked about this. They need, just like if I was going to do the wax up or you're going to do the wax up yourself. So they need the mounted models, face bar articulated, the photographic series. We talked about the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional checklist. They need that the treatment plan, and basically, again, the same info uh, if you were going to wax it up yourself. So that's kind of your mindset. Right. And, you know, one of the things, these next two slides, so the next slide is, especially with anterior cases, really what we're trying to do, again, is visualize in space where things need to go before we start irreversible dentistry. I think, again, it's the beauty of going through these checklists uh, and, and you know what, none of it's hard. You know, we went through the checklists on an earlier uh, series together. And honestly, it's just breaking things down into smaller questions and segments and answering things one at a time. And then the whole thing comes together. But one of the biggies is where should the front teeth go, especially if we're having a smile that we're redesigning? What's the right proportions? And really, where should that front tooth go, that maxillary central incisor in a vertical and horizontal position? And then once we've got that, we can literally um, figure out exactly the proportions of those teeth. And the next slide kind of shows that. So on the left is uh, where the patient is. And then those arrows and those, that's the degree of, (coughs) excuse me, that's the degree Mm -hmm. of change we want for those patients. Lengthen Mm -hmm. a millimeter, take take the tissue up two millimeters. And again, it's going through the checklist and answer those questions. Then the next is the wax up. And all that wax up is, is taking the photo from the two dimensional, what we thought we wanted to do, and now doing it uh, three dimensionally on the model. So we're taking again, what we thought we're doing it then in, in, on the models. Uh, mm-hmm. Does it work? Does it look like, do we like the, provi- the, the, the um, dimensions of the teeth? And does it work functionally? Because now we're on the articulator. Now we can see if we add this length, does it satisfy what we're trying to do for those patients? And then from there, Kirk, that's how we get to carry that to the patient to actually do the treatment. Awesome. Awesome. Now, any mistakes? I always like to point out mistakes or pitfalls in this whole process. Anything you'd point out? Yeah, well, you know, here's the easiest one. You don't follow the checklist. Right. So, and listen, probably since I started doing this Dawson type of dentistry, uh, I will say the probably the biggest mistakes I've had is when I get too smart for myself, mm-hmm. and I started going off script. Oh, I've got that. I've done it. A, I've done it a hundred times now, and then you know I miss something. You know, and we miss yeah. something. You know, if we go back to that, um, uh, yeah, that checklist book that we've talked about earlier. You know, Checklist um, Manifesto by yeah. Atuo Gawande. If you haven't That's read it. it, you need to. Yeah, it's a great book. But you know, they talk about predictability happens when you follow the checklist. The minute you get off script and it's like one person does something, another person does something else, predictability just drops. So it's really kind of when I get off script and I'm not following the checklist, I think that's the biggest thing that I get into. Right. And then 
Yep, go ahead. Oh, I, I just want to piggyback on that. The other thing that I've seen with you guys is that you're freeing up hard drive, drive space. So like when you have a checklist, you don't have all these files that are open. You know, you don't have to think as much. You know that you've got best practices in order here. And now you can give the, the hard drive space or the RAM to the things that matter most. And it creates the predictability that makes this fun. Yeah. I know if I follow the checklist that I'll be there. Yeah. You know, I know I'll be there. And, and again, there's kind of a built-in uh, check and balance as we go through. Cause again, remember, we don't go from looking at a patient, oh, this is obvious. They need this done. And then, gosh, if you had an appointment, you do it the next day. Yeah. You know, we're talking about, well, I'm going to look at you first. I'm going to diagnose. I'm going to look at it two-dimensionally. I'm going to prove it three-dimensionally. I'm going to have a conversation with you. Because here's, you know... The other thing is, you know, there's a person attached to what we do. Right. You know, dentistry can be hard sometimes. Dentistry is mm -hmm. a lot harder if you have a patient that doesn't think you're doing what they need to have done. I mean, and then if something doesn't happen well in that patient, that's, man, that is stressful. So yeah. I want to do this type of dentistry on patients that I've had a conversation on and they want me to do it. Right. I don't want to talk. We don't want to talk them into anything. I'm here to help you. You want me to help you. We've worked this out the best we can. We've had a conversation about it. You know, all the pros and cons, time, cost, everything else. Let's go. We're doing this together. It's a much easier way to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we also talked then about, again, if you actually get into the checklist, and that's probably less important, but, but you can't just take the models and send it to the lab and say, do it. The doctor has to at least do part of this. You're going to learn so much. I can't tell you the number of times that I've done a little bit of it and thought, I missed something, you know, and, and so now I need to add this or maybe I don't need that. So maybe my, com my treatment plan in the end is a little smaller or a little bigger. But again, the beauty of it is unless the doctor actually gets in there and does some of this, and it's not time consuming, you really, I don't think, aren't going to visualize. And you mm -hmm. don't want the la your lab technician to, um, at the end, say, now tell me what treatment I need to do. Like, yeah. we're, the, we're the doctor. And I work with, you know, I work with some really, really good technicians. And, and I want them to have the input. Like, if I've missed something, I want a phone call. You know, I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't want my ego to be too big that you can't question me. Please do. If I miss something, I would much rather know before I've started something rather than after. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so well, good. Yeah, Any yeah I, I think, you know, uh, a again, you got to get in there and work it out. And if you go to slide 11, I mean, that's not the most important, but that's kind of what we're looking for at the end. And, and all we mean by this is, and this is a wax up done by Walt Richardson, who's I've been doing my wax up with probably for 15 years or so. But it, the important thing here is that you're working out aesthetics, phonetics, and function. So really, really accurately on this, because the more accurately we on this, and this is why the records and the communication with your lab is so important, now when I actually start doing the treatment, I'm just going to be so much more accurate. And we can make prototypes that, that I, I mean, it's amazing how fast they can really look good and function well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, Drew, you got a question here from Australia. Is the Dawson Academy working on any kind of digital integration? And can we <laughs> integrate something like DSD to ma help make it, you know, aesthetic planning easier? Yeah, any so thoughts on that? Go to the next slide. Thanks for the setup. All right, cool. Well, so, great question, RJ. Yeah, it's, a, it's, right a great, it's a great question. And I think, yeah. you know, there's there, virtual restorations are where we're going. I mean, there's right. there's no doubt about it. And so the DSD, a way to visualize, you know, where you want the aesthetics to be. We have some of that. What we go through is the, is the Dawson Diagnostic Wizard. But again, what I like about those things is you're trying to figure out what change are we trying to affect before we start doing something irreversible. Right. And then the next part of that is, is how am I going to work that out before I do something on the patients? Now, we were just talking about analog. And again, we've got all the checklists for it. We're going digital. There's no doubt about it. We're, I mean, we've been scanning models for a number of years now. I think the record part with Facebook and Centric, there's ways that we can go through there. But there's no doubt now that if you do a CT scan and, and then do the models, that we can, we can just put the, put the uh, scanned 
uh, models on that on that CT scan, and you've got the patient's own articulator. I mean, that's right. that's super accurate. So, and now we can actually then do the digital wax up. So, if we want to mm -hmm. add a millimeter here, or lengthen, or shorten, whatever it's going to be, we can do that now virtually. Uh, and then we can, you know, there's all different ways that we can carry that on. So, prototypes we can do differently. Uh, approve provisionals rather than taking impressions. We can rescan it. Here's the important thing about it. I think you have to understand the foundation, the basics, and what we're trying to do. Right. And we're going to have different ways to get there and communicate with the lab. But I think the basic foundation is the same. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out what it is we're trying to change and why. And then we're trying to get those changes and pre-work them out before we do ir irreversible dentistry uh, to the patient. And then once we actually have those prototypes in the mouth, we have to have a way that we can communicate that we verify them to the laboratory. So the basics are the same. We can do it in an analog world, and we're going to get there in a digital world. There's no doubt about it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Any final thoughts on this whole process with the lab technician that I, you, you would know, say? You know, here would be my next thing is one, um, I think with this, have a conversation with a lab technician, you know, and, and explain to them what it is you're trying to do and why. And then get their help on, on, on how they can help you and how we can communicate best together. And some, some of this is simple stuff. How do you want me to send files? How do you want me to send you? I mean, I know this is kind of stupid to a certain regard, but how do you want me to send you 21 photos? Yeah. You know, because I can't send it to you via an email because it's right. too large. So we right. got to have a way to transfer this back and forth. Uh, if I'm, it, whether I'm going to work it out, my forms, how do I get that stuff to you? So just... Just get a pathway that we can communicate easily and you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Yeah. And here would be my next thing is that um, whenever we're done, you're done a case, uh, look at it again. I would take models. If you really, really want to get good, take models again, take photos again, do your workup again. Did we solve all the problems that we wanted to? Mm -hmm. uh, how are we on the aesthetics? How are we on the function? How are we in the phonetics? Is the patient comfortable? And what could we do better? And now I want to communicate with that laboratory. And, and I want to listen. Tell me what I could have done better to make your job easier. That's and awesome. then the reverse is also true. So check the egos at the door. And at the end of this, and, and, and the, you listen, you can be talking about a case that's a great success, but we still want to get better. I want to try to get better every time I do something. You know, the, the one thing with Dennis sometimes is you know, we're, we're, we have this perfection model. And mm -hmm. so that we're never satisfied with anything. Like we could right. always be better. You can always see that one thing. And I don't want to drive your, you know, we don't want to drive ourselves crazy. I want you to, we want you to enjoy your success, be proud of it. But yeah. also I think there's something that we can learn every time, but listen to your ceramist, your technician, how can we, we better achieve our results and be able to listen without that, you know, that critical factor. Absolutely. And a great piece of this is celebrating the case once it's done. Yeah. It's amazing how many lab techs say, I never got to see like the ultimate finished yeah. product. And that's a great way to solidify the relationship and put all the pieces together. And I have one other thought too. I heard Bill yeah. Lockhart say this years ago. He said, Kirk, on this path, perfection is dangerous. It's very dangerous. He yeah. said, Ex excellence is a good guy, is a, is a good goal. Um, perfection is God's job. Once in a while, all the elements just work out, you know, Perfect. and you're like, that was perfect. Perfect. You know, it's not, you know. And so just to piggyback on that too, Kirk, besides your lab, I think this is really important, especially these cases, they're multidiscipline cases. So you have other specialists involved. Yeah. Send that to them. They never get to see the end result. And yeah. you mentioned this earlier where you're trying to, we're trying to separate ourselves from everybody else out there. So, and this has happened with me and it will happen with other doctors is if you're, if your specialists see what you're doing, the level you're working, the degree you're trying to do this, and they're going to start to see that what they did contributed to this beautiful result, they're going to start sending you this type of patient because you're going to, you're doing it differently than somebody else. Yeah. Now I did, we did get another great question from Arjun sure. here. He said, uh, you know, thanks for the explanation on that. Are there any labs down under in Australia that understand the Dawson philosophy? I end up doing the entire mock-up and I'm scared to send it to a lab and then have to repeat the entire mock-up. So can you speak to that? 
Yeah, that, that's that's tough. I'm gonna say offhand, I don't I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I will look it up because we have a couple. Uh, we've got some Dawson doctors from Australia, so I can try to find out what labs they use. Right. Uh, and 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 secondarily, you know, even if you have a, a lab that maybe hasn't gone through some of this, you can still and it's more work for you, but you can still reach out to that technician, show them what you're doing, and, and you got to do some of the work maybe, but I'm sure that they'd want to learn this and do it for you. So yeah. you can maybe find that technician that's local and, and help them so that they can provide you with some some of this so you don't have to do the whole thing. Absolutely. Now, you and I have yeah. very strong opinions about embracing a path of always learning. <clears throat> but if I'm a young dentist watching this and I didn't know what the Dawson Academy was or yeah. I'm a dentist that's done a lot of training, you know, what is the Dawson Academy? How can I get involved? You and yeah. I are going to be teaching a course here coming up pretty soon, which is 701. And if you haven't yeah. been, we've got to go. But give us a little insight on what the Dawson Academy is. So uh, the Dawson Academy is, you know, all about this kind of dentistry, how to do more complex cases, how to be more predictable, right. uh, you know, how to deal with, uh, how to set these cases up right, how to deal with facial pain, you know, so it's all the stuff that I think you, you, you kind of weren't taught. It's more than tooth by tooth dentistry. It's about complete dentistry. Right. And, and again, it's not about a lot of dentistry. It's about trying to get patients healthy for the long term and doing dentistry that's going to be predictable solve their solve their problems with the least amount of dentistry for their lifetime. It's just yeah. a great way to practice. But you know what? It's a different approach. Uh, and and not every patient needs it, but unless you start the process with the right examination, you don't know. Amen. And, Amen. And so I think uh, the introductory seminar, which you know you and I are going to be doing with John Cranham in February is a great start. Um, you know, I, I talked to you about that white paper with the lab technician. Um, uh, oh, and you have a webinar coming up too, don't you? <clears throat> uh, no, or no, not that I know. Okay. Of. All right. Sorry about that's that. It. I misspoke. That's all um, right. No worries. I've got a bunch of links of, of your stuff right here. And then, but the one you and I are going to be together is on February 8th. That's in Florida. That'll be Dawson Seminar One. We'll post a link to it in the show notes. And so if you're interested, please join us. We'd love to have you there. You will absolutely love it. So. Awesome, buddy. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you guys for all your questions. And Drew, we're going to have you back for so many other things. This is just one of many things I love, love, love just learning from you. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But uh, if you're watching thank the Best you. Practices Show, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed today, which I hope you did, do us a favor, just hit the share button and uh, keep sending us suggestions for the show or things you'd love to see from Drew in the future. And we'll do our best to get them all lined up. But until we see you next time, keep watching the best practice show. You guys Thanks. have a great rest of the Thanks, day. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Thanks.